Welcome back to Sportsline right here on News Channel 5 Plus. Everybody, John Burton with you. And we are pleased to be joined on the phone by a friend of show, sports columnist from The Athletic, the great Joe Rexroad joins us. Joe, good evening. Hello, John. How are you? Good to hear your voice. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, it's great to talk to you as well. Do you have a big Fourth of July weekend planned? A little bit of uh, family. We're going we're gonna, to, you know, drive around a little bit and... Uh, Maybe one thing we're going to check out is Savannah, Georgia, which is something we've never done. So a little bit of family vacay coming. I have been to Savannah. It is actually a beautiful, beautiful city. You're going to absolutely love it. So um, Godspeed to you and your family. Should be a fun weekend. All right. So, uh, so many, so much, so many things going on, Joe. Let's start with the Preds and the future ownership change with former Tennessee Governor Bill Haslam coming in to eventually, within the next, I guess, three years or so, be the majority owner as he will buy out the ownership group currently headed by Herb Fritch. You know, my initial thoughts about the sale and everything going on with the Preds was, what would it mean for the future of David Poyle? What do you think it means for the future of David Poyle? Obviously, you know, legendary career as a GM. He's the only GM the Nashville Predators have ever had. He's a Hall of Famer. He's the winningest GM in NHL history. But my first thought, Joe, was, wow, at, at, at this stage of his life and his career, does he want to work for another boss? Does he want to work for another owner? What do you think this means for David Poyle short and long term with Bill Haslam coming in to eventually be the majority owner of the Nashville Predators? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I think short term, it doesn't mean a ton. Although, you know, Bill Haslam's still going to have some input. I mean, he's going to, you know, be kind of getting in the lay of the land and, and getting himself into the organization. And he's going to have, say, he's still going to have shares to start. So, I mean, pretty quickly, like, he will have some kind of voice, but, you know, the majority ownership, I mean, basically, you know, Herb Fritsch and Tom Segerand have kind of been the, the decision makers. While, while it's a big ownership group and, of course, everyone's still involved, I mean, they've basically, one of the two of them has been the, the chairman for you know, over the last many years. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like, if, like, you know, if David Poyle's still in his job when Bill Haslam becomes majority owner does he become chairman is it a different level of you know accountability pressure just a different vibe i don't know and that, the thing is like i still think you know david poyle could be not all that far from retiring anyway you right. know i feel like he's still in this situation of trying to make a last run at a cup and you know in, in a in a pretty short period of time, they could become apparent that a long rebuild is necessary. So mm -hmm. it's just hard to answer the question, but I do think that Bill has, them. I think one thing for sure, the, uh, apart from Poyle, is that you know I think Bill Haslam is going to give the ownership group a public face, someone who's actually willing to come out and talk at times, which I think is good. Yeah. And then, you know, this, just the security of having someone from this state who's a billionaire, um, if things do go rough for a few years with a losing team and no playoffs and things like that, that's that's a nice security blanket for the, for the franchise. Joe, you kind of mentioned it. I mean, you know, we just saw the Colorado Avalanche win the Stanley Cup and they beat the team in the Tampa Bay Lightning that won the previous two Stanley Cups. You look at the talent in the Western Conference and throughout the National Hockey League, you know, the Preds have some really good individual players, but you know, there's good players, and then there's what the Colorado Avalanche and Tampa Bay Lightning have. You could throw the Edmonton Oilers in there with their two studs, McDavid and Dreisaitl. It's pretty clear to me, Joe, that, that the Predators don't have that elite-level talent to chase a Stanley Cup. So, given that, even though, you know, even though Yossi's really good, they got two 40-goal scorers in, in Duchesne and Forsberg, and I'll ask you about him in a second. And obviously, you know, uh, Soros was a Vesna Trophy finalist, but... You know, there's good and then there's elite good. At what point do the Preds have to decide, you know what, we need to tear this thing down and rebuild it because as currently constructed, we're not good enough right now to compete with those teams and really make that run for the Stanley Cup. I guess my question is, you know, do, are, do you anticipate this team still pushing to win that Stanley Cup over the next couple of years? Or do you think at some point they'll say, hey, you know what, it may be time to start the rebuild? 
Well, I think if they were going to do a serious rebuild, trading Forsberg would have been a, a, a one thing to do. You know, like yeah. like getting a lot back for for him uh, and punting on a, the playoffs this year, but they didn't do that. And you know, when you look at some of their contracts and and the, what they have left on them, it, I think it's going to be hard for them to do that. So, I think they're I think they're going to go for it as well as they can. Uh, now, how can they go for it? Like you said, I mean, I agree with you. They don't have the elite, elite forwards, and you don't just snap your fingers and get those guys. I mean, if there's a run in the Preds in the short term, it's more of like the St. Louis Blues model of a couple of years ago, right? Like yep. a really good, solid team, you know, more good forwards, more good players, and that includes on defense. I mean, they've got to get better there too. But the one thing they do have that makes you feel like it's possible is they, they have the goaltender. You know, when, while you have the goaltender – in his prime, um, you know, you, I mean, that, that's one argument for like going for it. It's just the difficulty is just like, like how do you how do you manage to add? I mean, basically they had four top six forwards last year, you know, they, mm-hmm. and they had two just rotating spots, and they didn't have anyone good enough to to adequately fill those spots. I mean, to me, they got to fill that with two people, and maybe that's somebody like a Tolvin and a Tomasino, someone. Young, who who really breaks through, but it's got to be one more big name, and that's on top of signing Forsberg, which of course we still don't know if that's happening. Yeah, and David Poyle speaking about that last week. I mean, you know, the one thing we all respect about David Poyle, he doesn't like to play games with the media, and he'll pretty much tell you as much as he can and be as honest with us uh, and and the fans as he can. He didn't exactly sound too optimistic that a new deal with Forsberg could get done. What's, what's your gut feeling on this? Mine changes every day. You know, so, uh, I'll probably wake up tomorrow and say, yeah, they'll sign him. But I woke up today basically thinking, <laughs> you know, he's not going to be here next year. They may have to trade his rights. I mean, you, got, you only got a couple of weeks left to get this thing figured out. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm leaning pretty heavily towards they're going to figure it out because I, I still think that figure it out basically just means Poyle has to buckle, and he has to. Mm-hmm. But you, you, you've given up all your leverage if you're David Poyle. Um, you know, you had the trading deadline that passed, um, and now you know. Look, I mean, I think I mean, you could make a case. You see, you see the LA Kings make a trade for Kevin Fiala mm-hmm. uh, and give him a huge deal. They still could. Fit Forsberg, and it could be a total reu- uh, West Coast reunion of you know Fiala, Arvidsson, and Forsberg, um, <laughs> right. and, you know, which would be wild. Yeah, uh, Pred- Preds West. That- <laughs> That's right, Preds West, baby. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, there's other teams that w- will be interested in him, but I, I just I I do believe Forsberg when he says he wants to be here. I just I. I question whether you'd be as visible as he has been mm-hmm. if you didn't. It's possible, but you know, it, it just, I feel like he wants to be here and it's just, he, he's where he is knowing that he can go out there. And yes, a team can only offer him seven years and the Preds right now can offer him eight, but I just think Poyle is going to have to come across whatever the line is. And I don't see how Poyle decides not to do that. I just don't see how Poyle ultimately says, nah, sorry, it's just a little too much. Like, Poyle loses him, and I don't know, public opinion isn't everything. He's sure. still going to have his job, but man, is he going to be as embattled by far as he's ever been as general manager of the Preds if that happens. Joe, do you think it comes down to years, no trade clause, money, all of the above? What do you think are the sticking points with this Forsberg deal? Well, Poyle said that they're offering eight, so I mean, they're definitely giving them the full eight, as they should. I mean, that's an advantage for them, though. These guaranteed contracts, you can give less AAV and still have more, you know, money. I mean, if a team out there wants to give them nine million a year, okay, that's 63 over seven. They can only offer seven. The president can give them 64 by giving them eight a year. So, I, I think you, I think you're right on that. No movement. I would assume there's something there that they have to work out. Poyle doesn't like giving that stuff out. He gave a full one to Yossi. Mm-hmm. To me, that kind of opens Pandora's box. But I think it's mostly money. I think it comes down to money. And Poyle's been able to, you know, engineer a lot of pretty team-friendly deals over the years, I would say. Um, I know that, you know, some of those deals don't look great right now. Like, you know, Matt Duchesne and, and, and Joe Hanson and Ryan Ellis didn't earlier. You know, they traded him away, but... Um, I think he's going to have to just uh, suck it up and, and pay him probably close to nine a year would be my guess. 
Yeah, it seems like they got to slot him somewhere between, you know, Yossi, who's the top guy, and, you know, Duchesne slash Johansson in that area somewhere. Yeah. So interesting days ahead for the Nashville Predators. Uh, Joe, we've talked about what has been a very interesting and kind of noisy offseason for the Tennessee Titans. Uh, we get through the draft. We get through the combine. We get through, uh, you know, OTAs and minicamp. We've had our little issues here. The A.J. Brown trade is Jeff Simmons holding out. You know, the Tannehill, not my job to mentor Malik Willis, et cetera, et cetera. As we sit here now, as we've had time to kind of digest it all this offseason, still a few weeks to go until training camp starts, what would be your state of the Tennessee Titans address as we sit here in late June? Oh, man. Well, <laughs> one, I mean. Loaded I'm question, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot to that one. I don't know if you have time. <laughs> we got all the time in the world, man. Let her rip. Why the heck did they trade A.J. Brown? I know, I know. I keep uh, coming back to that, Joe. <laughs> Joe, I keep coming back yeah. to that. I'm sorry. I do. I mean, part, yeah. I, I just, I don't get it, man. No, uh, I think it, again, I thought so on that night. I haven't changed at all. I think that, I think they're really going to regret it. But, but you know, in the meantime, I, I mean, I, look, I think they can be very good this year you know, if they can be solid on offense. I mean, that's, that's what's, it's amazing when you think about a year ago, we're like, is this going to be the best offense ever? Mm -hmm. But is their defense going to suck? <laughs> and now it's like, man, are they going to be a top three defense? And is their offense going to suck? I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's completely flip-flops. Yeah. But that's how it looks to me. I like their D a lot. I think their front seven is, uh, you, it, it's up there, you know, with with all those pieces. And you think about Bud Dupree now after a full off season with no rehab and, you know, David Long and Cunningham inside. I mean, I, you know, I think that they're going to be uh, tough on quarterbacks this year. I think they have possible answers at cornerback. That's the only question I have. But then offense, I just – you're talking about receiver and offensive line just to me look like they could be huge problems. Yeah. Now, look, I like I mean, I like Robert Woods. Right. I, I think he's a good player. He's going to be good. And I'll tell you, I, I, the one guy – two guys who stood out to me on offense this spring, and I think they're both going to be – very good. Austin Hooper is a really good pickup. He's he's a legit number one tight end, and I think he's going to produce like that this year. I think he and Tannehill are going to have great connection. And Nick Westbrook Akina is better than I think anybody would have guessed. Whoever saw him in that first training camp, he's going to be at least a reliable target. You know, a good, but he needs to be the third guy. You right. know, they need Traylon Burks to you know, live, come somewhere within the neighborhood of being picked 18th and basically replacing a Jim Brown and then uh, that offensive line JB I mean I just you got you got four guys for two spots left guard right tackle mm -hmm. and I have no idea right now if any of the four are uh starting caliber players yeah. none of them I mean you know none of them may be or Petit Frere may not be ready and boy that could be big trouble if that's the case yeah, but, you know, and everybody I talk to, all just, they all say the same thing. Well, you got the coach of the year in Mike Vrabel, and that's true, but he can only do so much, right? You know, if that offensive line is bad, and, you know, like you said, or the, or the uh, passing offense is not very explosive because of whatever reasons, there's only so much he can do, even though, you know, he's proven to be a fine NFL head coach. Yeah, well, I, and I think and he, he's, he's been terrific overall, you know, but like you said, it's still, I mean, he, he says it all the time. This is about players, not plays. Um, now, I do think that this team could be a very good you know, division-winning team again, mm -hmm. but, um, but, but probably by winning a lot of like 20 to 17, 23 to 19 type games, you know? I mean, yep. I think you're going to see more games like that, but hey. I mean, if you win that way, you win that way. And, you know, we haven't talked about Derrick Henry. I mean, if he's, if he's great, if he's back, if he's him all the way, I think that makes the offensive line better, makes Tannehill better. And, then, you know, then you really could have something. Yeah, no question about it. Uh, obviously, the story of the NFL offseason, the Deshaun Watson case. Now, the NFL, of course, is doing something different this year. They've got the independent arbitrator to kind of uh, – you know, gather the evidence and make a suggestion or a decision uh, as as opposed to a uh, suspension, unlike years past when Roger Goodell had that power. So we're kind of walking a tightrope here with 
Deshaun Watson. Obviously, the accusations are out there. There are no criminal charges pending that we know of. But, you know, I don't know. You know, the, the, he's having this disciplinary hearings going on right now somewhere in Delaware, I guess. And nobody seems to know how this is going to turn out. You're hearing a year suspension, six games, eight games. You know, I was in Pittsburgh when Roethlisberger got six knocked down to four because of what happened in what allegedly happened in Georgia in a, in a year before that in Utah. So, you know, these are uncharted waters for the National Football League. What do you, you know, what's your gut feeling about how this could turn out for Deshaun Watson and the Cleveland Browns? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's not exactly like, you know, any other situation. And, and I just, I look at it and I say, it just seems like the, the momentum is bad for, like a year is almost a lock, you know, mm. like, and, and certainly the NFLPA, I mean, and that's in terms of the punishment initially handed down. There's going to be appeal process and all that. Mm -hmm. Goodell w wouldn't necessarily be, be uh, hearing that either, by the way, which is interesting. But right. I mean, I, I feel like with the latest information, the Jenny Brentis New York Times piece on, you know, on, on at least 66 women and all the details that were in that, it's just, you know, like you said, no criminal charges, but this is, I mean, this is predatory behavior. I, you know, yeah. there's just no way, other way to put it. And right. uh, again, it's just hard to, it's hard to know exactly where it lands, but I think that they're going to try to do the indefinite, at least a year thing. That seems to be the, you know, the buzz. And then it'll be very interesting to see where it actually lands. My, my guess right now would be it just lands at a year. Hmm. But, you, you know, in that case, you're still talking about then someone who wouldn't be playing football for two straight seasons. Right. You're talking about a team that loaded up, gave him $230 million guaranteed and really has a lot of guys this year under contract, I mean, to go for it this year. I was going to say, Joe, they've got, uh, great, they got a great looking roster. I mean, they're, they're, they're loaded for yeah. bear. And, you know, the only missing piece was the quarterback. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. But you're right. This is a oh, roster absolutely. ready to win right now. Yeah, so... It just it looks like a obviously just a complete blunder on the part of the Browns. You know that initial press conference, you know, everybody's ripping them for you know they're not answering the questions about if they ever talked to anybody or that you know how deeply did they investigate all this stuff. And it was all the and, and to me it was just like no, nah, it's just typical NFL. They don't you know right. they're like settle it, get it out of my face. What are you on the field? That's what we care about. Mm -hmm. And I thought you know I, I thought hey I mean, we've seen this a ton of times, but. But now we're actually seeing, like, this is why, even if, forget the moral obligation, this is why you actually do your homework, right? Yes. Because, I mean, they have totally botched this. And if they knew that this was possible, uh, you know, that they, that, that they would lose, you know, they knew that he was going to miss part of this season. Of course they did. Right. But if they knew that it might be th this season or more, I mean, I, I, I really, I'd love to know then what their offer would look like, what the whole pursuit of him would have looked like league-wide, because it was, it was very intense. Did you uh, hear what Baker Mayfield had to say yesterday? I did. Uh, actually, I thought he, I was, I, I figured he might just throw up double middle. Right. I never <laughs> want to hear the Cleveland Browns again. You know? So, so let me ask you then. I mean, he basically said, for those that don't know, he was interviewed and said. You know, he did. He kind of left the door slightly open that maybe, you know, one more year in Cleveland could actually happen if somebody reached out. You know, do the Browns do they do they dare go back to Baker Mayfield, who's under contract for this year? They have to pay him eighteen point nine million dollars this year, no matter what, and is fully guaranteed under the fifth year uh, option. Do they go hat in hand and say, "Hey, Baker, how about one more year? We're sorry, you know, we, we but we need you." Because they could still win. No. You know, if, if Baker stays healthy, I think they could still win a few games. Well, I do, too. I mean, Baker Mayfield would, would definitely be a, a better option. I still think Baker Mayfield like could be a good quarterback. Mm -hmm. in this league. I mean, last year, he was just, I thought, actually, he deserved a little bit, even though he acted immature, yeah. of course, at times. I thought he He's his own worst enemy, isn't he? Out. Yeah. He is. But I, I, I just I don't think that's happening. I, I think I mean, it sounds like they've already just like moved on, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's just it would just be weird, although he would be better than Brissett and all that. Like, it would just be a totally how, how weird would that vibe be? Ooh, you know, wow. Because everybody would know it's purely just like desperation. And I mean, they had totally moved on. He had moved on. So I don't think so. I mean, I think ultimately um, they're going to get 
you know, someone's going to get a really good deal and and get a quarterback, Seattle or you know maybe maybe Carolina. I think he's going to be Seattle's quarterback. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of it would be like a couple that are basically, for all intents and purposes, divorced, but they're staying together for the kids. It would be very, very awkward. Yeah. Well, Joe, I appreciate after you being, after being apart for like a year. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we're you gonna know? give yeah. we're gonna give it another try, <laughs> kind of, sort of, you know. Yeah. Uh, but dad's but dad's gonna sleep on the couch. Yeah. Okay. But uh, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and eat chunky soup. That's right. <laughs> Well, Joe, I appreciate you joining me tonight. Always a pleasure, my man. Uh, get your plugs in. How can people keep up with you? Obviously, 102.5, uh, the game with my man, uh, Robbie Stanley, another friend of the show, and The Athletic. Yeah, that's at 6 to 10 every day, 102.5 and 106.3, and then at Joe Rexford on Twitter, theathletic.com. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. And, you know, then I just I, – I, I photobomb occasionally and have goofy expressions on various TV stations <laughs> around town, too, uh, as players are being interviewed. So. <laughs> Joe, were you aware that I also do a, a morning radio show here in Nashville? I didn't know if you knew that or not. Oh, oh I do know that, my friend. <laughs> and, see, I, you know, like I want to listen more to yours, but I'm doing mine. It's no fair. I understand. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll work it out. All right. Well, Joe, thanks so much. Have a great Fourth <laughs> of July weekend. Enjoy your family. And uh, we'll be seeing you later next month in training camp. Sounds good, JB. All right. Thanks for having me, man. You got it, man. There he goes. Joe Rexroad from The Athletic. All right. Time for another break. When we come back. We're going to hear from the nature boy, Ric Flair, his press conference from last week as he gets ready for the final match of his career here in Nashville, July 31st. Don't go anywhere.